Hey everyone, this is Pastor Todd and Miss Daphne. We pastor Transformation Church here in Seminole, Texas, and I believe that this message is going to be a blessing to you. Our vision is to transform lives and change the world. We want to invite you to join us online or in person Sundays at 10.30 a.m. or Wednesdays at 7 p.m. We hope to see you there. Well, isn't it good to be in church today? Look at your neighbor Sam. I'm glad you made it to church. Oh, find somebody else around and say, glad you made it to church. And I look them straight in the eye and say, looks like you need this. Hallelujah. If you got your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 28, verse number 1. We want to welcome all of our visitors today, all of our guests to uh, Transformation Church. Thank you so much for being here. And the seat back in front of you is all the information that you need about our church. You could go to dtc.com and you can find out even more about what's going on in our church. Glad you're here. Hey, if you're watching online, thank you so much for being a part of our service. Whatever we do here, you can do there. Online is good, but being in church is better. Can I get an amen? Matthew chapter 28, verse number 1 says this. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. Behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the, from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, his clothes as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Verse number five. And the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. As he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you in Galilee and there you will see him. Behold, I've told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. I love what verse number six says. He is not here for he is risen as he said. I like specifically the last part, as he said. I mean, Jesus had a purpose and a plan when he came to this earth. His purpose and his plan was to redeem mankind out of a sinful nature and restore a relationship with the Heavenly Father. And I want you to know today that this is the day of redemption. This is the day that we get to celebrate the fact that Jesus died on the cross, arose again on the third day, and is alive forevermore. We celebrate Easter because Jesus is alive. How many believe that Jesus is alive? Let me help you a little bit with that. The evidence is really real that he is alive. Jesus predicted his resurrection. The Bible records in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Even though his followers didn't understand what he was telling them at that time, they remembered later on his words and recorded them. See, evidence is true that he knew he was going to to die on the cross, but he also knew that he would be alive for us today. Not only is the evidence real with that, but Jesus made numerous appearances to his followers. He confirmed the mourners outside his tomb on Sunday morning on the road to Emmaus. He explained things about himself from the Old Testament. And later, he ate with them and invited them to touch his hands and his side. The scriptures record that Jesus was seen by more than 500 people at a time. He's alive. Some may argue that a few people could have agreed to a deception kind of situation, but how can one explain the testimony of 500 people that saw Jesus after he arose again from the grave? Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus is alive. Come on, find some and say, Jesus is alive. Man, the evidence is real because, see, the relentless faith of the disciples convinces us of the resurrection. Those disciples who were once so afraid that they left their Lord now unashamedly proclaimed the good news, risking their own lives to preach. Why? They knew Jesus was alive. Their bold and courageous behavior does not make sense unless they knew without absolute assurity that Jesus had been raised from the dead. 
See, the evidence is real. Because of the growth of the Christian church, it confirms the resurrection. Peter's very first sermon, which dealt with Christ's resurrection, stirred people to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Luke actually records this in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. That day, there were added about 3,000 souls. That group of believers, those 3,000 souls, has multiplied until now. It reaches all around the world. Today, there are hundreds of millions of believers celebrating the life of Jesus. Come on, there's church services all over the world going on, and we're celebrating Jesus today. Aren't you thankful that Jesus is alive? He is alive. Most assuredly, I tell you, he is alive. Finally, the testimony of hundreds of millions of transformed lives through the, all the centuries shows the power of the resurrection. Many have been delivered from addictions. The down and out and desperate have found hope. Broken marriages have been restored. The undeniable proof for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that he is living with all of his resurrection, life, and transforming power within each and every believer. Jesus is alive. Come on, somebody say, Jesus is alive. Because Jesus is alive, we have eternal life. In John chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus said, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hands. Do you realize that this life is just a short vapor in time? But for the believer, we get to spend eternity with him. Rejoicing in a life that can't even be compared to the life that we live now. The eternal life is the best kind of life that we get to look forward to and embrace when that trumpet blows or whenever our bodies get too tired to live on this earth any longer. But for the believer, eternal, eternal life is assured because Jesus is alive. Because Jesus is alive, we have authority to rule and reign in this life. In Romans chapter 5, verse number 15, for if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life. Will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. I want you to know that he's given you the authority and power to rule and reign in this life. You're not going under, you're going over. You're not defeated, you're an overcomer. You already have the victory because Jesus is alive. He's empowered you to rule and reign in this life. The devil's defeated. The devil's underneath your feet. We submit ourselves to God, we resist the devil, and he flees. There's no weapon formed against you that shall prosper. No sickness can take you out. No, no depression can leave you helpless. Oh, because Jesus is alive and we have the resurrection and the life on the inside of us, we can rule and reign in this life. Oh, I believe that we always triumph in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus is alive, we have the abundant life. In John chapter 10, verse number 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. But Jesus said this, this. He said, I have come that they may have life and, they, they have mad, and that they may have it more abundantly. I mean, you know, Jesus doesn't want you just to barely get by. Come on, somebody. Jesus doesn't want you to barely get by. He died on the cross and rose again on the third day so you can have the abundant life. Exceedingly abundantly above all that you ever ask or think. Because see, with God, all things are possible. In your own um, possibilities, it's very limited. But God, all things are possible. He, he, those who believe, nothing's impossible for you. Hallelujah. Why? Because he is alive and he's given us the abundant life. Look to your neighbor and say, you got the abundant life. I heard somebody say this one time, the abundant life will make me want to do a bun dance. <laughs> do it. Let's go. You first. Psalm chapter 91, verse number 16 says this, With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. But see, because of Jesus is alive, we can live a long life. We can live a long life. With long life, the Bible says, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Jesus is alive. We get to enjoy that abundant life, that long life here on this earth. Because Jesus is alive, we get to live the Spirit-filled life. In Romans chapter 8, verse number 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, 
These are the sons of God. Or we can say it like this, the sons and daughters of God. Because we're born again. Because the life of God is on the inside of us. We can enjoy the very fact that the Spirit of God's on the inside of us and leads us and guides us. We're never alone. I said we're never alone. We got the Spirit of the living God, that resurrection power, that life of God's on the inside of us. You never have to ever feel alone again whenever you have the life of God on the inside of you. No more depression. Hallelujah. No more anxiety. No more stress. No more losing your anger anymore or, or getting angry or losing, losing your peace anymore. Why? Because with God, He's given us His Son, Jesus, and His life is on the inside of us, and we live a Spirit-led life. Because of Jesus and because He's alive, we can live a faith-filled life. In Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20, Paul said this. He said, I've been crucified with Christ. I've been crucified with Christ. He, he realized that he was there with Jesus whenever he was crucified. He goes on and says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul recognized that he had, the, he had a fleshly nature. But even in that fleshly nature, he made the decision to make a bold statement that said, I will live by faith. When you know that you have the life of God on the inside of you, it's easy to trust our Heavenly Father. When you have the life of God on the inside of you, it's easy for you to just throw caution to the wind and just step out in faith and say, God's for me. Who could be against me? His word says it. I believe it. That settles it. No matter what I'm facing, no matter what circumstance may come my way, his word is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If that's the truth, that truth will, tr will change my present situation. Amen. So I, I believe that because Jesus is alive, we have the honor and the privilege to live a faith-filled life. Because Jesus is alive, we can live a, a, a surrendered life. I like this one because Jesus, in Matthew chapter 20, verse number 28, the Bible says, Just as a son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, Christianity is not all about you. Go on, look at your neighbor and say, it's not all about you. To be a Christian, it's about serving others. It's about being a blessing to others. It's about thinking about others first before yourself. That's what it means to be Christ-like, to be a follower of Christ, instead of demanding your own way all the time. No, to be a Christian means that you're there to be a blessing to somebody. And then God will, God's your source. God will take care of whatever need that is. We, we have this, this life on the inside of us, and that life draws us to want to be a blessing to somebody. It draws us, it leads us to want to help somebody. It, it, it helps us help others. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's not all about you. How many believe that today? Come on, I, I want to live serving others. I want to live serving the King of kings and Lord of lords. It's interesting. This is what happens when I make the decision to live just a surrendered life to him. All of my needs just suddenly and supernaturally get taken care of. But if I become selfish and I try to figure it out myself and try to solve my own problems all the time, it seems like it, it, it just never works out like it always, what I always thought it should. But oh, but whenever I just live that surrendered life, God, you just take care of this. You take control of this. I give my life to you. I give this situation to you. You just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And supernatural things begin to happen. Miracles begin to happen. God starts lining up things that I never even thought possible. He starts putting the pieces together. And then I sit back and I go, look what the Lord has done. Because there's no possible way I'm smart enough to figure that one out. God had to do it. Come on, just look at your neighbor right now and say, you're not smart enough. <laughs> you're just not smart enough to always figure everything out. You need God. We need God. See, we celebrate Easter because we've received a new life. We celebrate not only the fact that Jesus is alive and that, that tomb is empty, but we celebrate the fact that Jesus gave us his life. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 6. Verse number 48, Romans chapter, excuse me, Romans 6 verse 4, and we'll read verses 4 through 8. The Bible says this, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead, hallelujah, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. 
Even so, we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also should be in the likeness of his resurrection. If you can believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again on the third day, you can believe in this new life in Christ Jesus, that you no longer have to live for yourself, that it's the abundant life, the faith-filled life, the spirit-filled life, and all the things that I just said. Boy, if you can believe that Jesus is alive today, you can believe that that very life is on the inside of you, helping you every single day of your life. It's the life of God on the inside of you because he's alive that helps you through every situation that you face. Because, see, we walk in the newness of life because of the power, because the power of sin has been broken off of our lives. In Romans chapter 6, verse number 6, the New Living Translation says this, We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power. Woo, that's shouting ground right there. That sin might lose its power. That sin might lose its power. We are no longer slaves to sin. I'm not so. The Bible's saying this. Verse number seven. For we died with Christ. We were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we will also live with him. See, we're not only just celebrating the fact that Jesus is alive. We're celebrating that the power of sin has been broken. Come on, somebody. The power of sin has been broken off of our lives. It doesn't mean that, that we're perfect and that we don't sin. No, the power of that sin has been broken. Humans still choose to sin, but we don't have to succumb to the power of that sin anymore. It's a choice to sin now. We can no longer have to sit around and say, well, the devil made me do it. No, it's a choice that we, we accept the temptation from Satan or the temptation from our flesh. But the power of sin has been broken. Come on, somebody. The power of sin has been broken. The power of addiction has been broken. The power of depression has been broken. The power of anxiety has been broken. Come on, somebody. Jesus is alive, and he broke it, destroyed it at Calvary. When he walked out of that grave, freedom walked out with him. The life of God walked out with him. When you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, you accepted freedom from disease, freedom from sickness, freedom from lack, freedom from depression, freedom from, from anxiousness and stress. Freedom is yours. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Come on, look to your neighbor and say, he's preaching right now. You need some hankies back in the back waving at me. Go ahead, white boy. White lightning. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. I felt that. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 1. See, we walk in the newness of life because of the power. The power of sin has been broken off of our lives. But not only that, we walk in newness of life because our former life is gone. Aren't you thankful for that? Your former life is gone. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 1. I'll read this from the New Living Translation. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is a spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Verse 3. All of us used to live that way following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just as everyone else. Verse 4, but God, I like those two words, but God, but God, who's rich in his mercy, he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life. Come on, somebody. He gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that we've been saved. He raised us up from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly reigns because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all that he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you. Verse number eight. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. 
Woo, I like that. Verse number nine. Salvation is not a reward for good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. No. Verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the things which he planned for us a long time ago. Hallelujah. You once were, were, were just lost, you heathen. We are one time, we are all heathens, just lost. But God, come on somebody, but God in his rich and mercy, he said, no, I'm going to send my son Jesus so they can no longer be bound to the world. They can no longer be bound to that sinful nature. I'm going to send my son because I want to restore a relationship with my creation. So I sent my son to you and all you have to do is receive him and have that reunited relationship back with our heavenly father. Sin is broken, and we can live a new life in Christ Jesus. The past is gone. Come on, high five. Somebody say, the past is gone. A new life has begun. You're there in Ephesians chapter 2. Jump over to Ephesians chapter 3. We walk in newness of life because we have been empowered by the Holy Spirit. We've been empowered by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and earth. And I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. See, Paul was praying for the church at Ephesus. He's praying for believers that they would get a revelation that they're not just saved, but they've been empowered by the spirit of the living God. I like what 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 7 says, and we're all familiar with this. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, but of power, and of love, and of sound mind. When you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you receive the spirit of the living God. You received his power. It enables us to live a spirit-filled life where you can be led by the Spirit. You know, we have that, that anointing on the inside of us, and we know all things. You no longer have to walk through life trying to figure things out. No, you got the anointing on the, you got the, the Spirit of the living God that can help you and show you and lead you and guide you every step of the way to where you're not wandering through life aimlessly trying to figure things out. I mean, you know, God knew, He knows you well enough, and He knew that you would need help. Go on, look at your neighbor and say, you need help. One day. He, he knows you better than you think you do. Or, yeah, something like that. He knows you. And he knows you well enough that he said, I've got to give, I've got to give, them, a, I've got to give them me in spirit form. Because they're going to need help in this wicked world. And that's why I'm so thankful for the life of God in Jesus. Because when Jesus died on the cross and again, rose again on that third day, when he walked out of that tomb. Come on, somebody. When he walked out of that tomb, he was walking out of that tomb for me and you. He was already thinking, I'm, I'm empowering them to live a victorious life on this earth. Just as I defeated Satan, I'm empowering them to defeat, the sa defeat Satan also. Just as God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us a, a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. Now, you might be sitting here today, and you might be like, yeah, I've, I, I've heard all these scriptures, and I know all these things. And, and you might be one of those super spiritual ones. That is here today. But I want you to know that you still have weaknesses. All of us have, have to face the fact that we still are weak in areas in our lives. But when we also understand that there's a life. The life of Christ is on the inside of us. We don't have to be bound by those weaknesses anymore. Those very things that, that cause you to stumble every once in a while or, or stumble occasionally. No, you got the life of God on the inside of you that can pick you right back up and keep you from doing it again and again and again. It's the life of God on the inside of you that helps you live a victorious life. And there's so much that we can be thankful for because of the life of Christ on the inside of us. I believe that today is a day of redemption for many people here. 
I believe that today's a day to, for you as, as Christians that, that are, are churchgoers and, and those that, that have been going to church all your life. Today's a day that you need to be reminded that the life of God is on the inside of you. Our men just got back from a mountain men weekend there at Mo Ranch. And, and how many men enjoyed that? Had a powerful time. We had like 60 guys there or something. And um, just a powerful time. And I, I was just kind of going down memory lane because at the age of eight years old, I got filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues at that camp. That was 46 years ago. Wow, I know. Some of y'all ain't even 40 years old. And, and I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm at this camp and I'm, I, I remind myself of how good God is. And I'm reminding myself of how my parents put me at a camp to where I could experience the presence of God. That my kids didn't take me out of church or, or occasionally went to church. No, they, they put me in the presence of God. And I'm so thankful for that because I could, I could look at my son who was with me at that camp and see how he's ministering the gospel. And knowing in, in, in several years that my grandson, J.J., is going to be there. And that there's a legacy, a, a heritage that's going to be passed down from generation to generation. And that heritage and that legacy is going to be passed down. It's the life of God. That's passed down. And then I get to see my children raised in the life of God. And I'm thankful. I can look back 46 years and say, look what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. And I'm thankful for my parents. I'm thankful that they put me in the presence of God. Because I didn't want to. I remember at eight years old, I wanted to go play basketball and football. I didn't want to go to no church camp. Church camp. A bunch of wimps go to church camp. <laughs> Not at all. I'm so thankful that I sucked up my own pride at eight years old and submitted to my parents and went. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I don't know, this just shifted. Parents, I want, you to, I want you to know this, that it's your responsibility to put your kids in the presence of God so they can experience the life of Jesus. Amen. Are they crazy at times? Absolutely. They're just like you. They're a product of their raising. Amen. Are there going to be difficult times that you're going to, you know, miss opportunities to be in the presence of God? Absolutely. It's called life. But make it a priority. Come on, somebody. Make it a priority. You don't have to be perfect at it, but make it a priority. That way one of your kids can, can look back 46 years later and say, thank you, Lord, for my parents put me in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. And I'm thankful for the life of God. But I want to give you an opportunity today to not just only experience the life of God, but I want you to make a decision today that I will, I will endeavor to always remind myself that the life of God is on the inside of me. Just say that. Say, the life of God is on the inside of me. Say it again. Say, the life of God is on the inside of me. At this moment, the worship team is going to come up. And if everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to pray for some people today. Maybe you're here today and, and you've fallen away from the Lord. And you might be thinking, man, I, I, used to, I used to get excited about God. I used to get excited about coming to church. I used to, you know, love being in, in God's presence. But, man, I just got so busy. I've just fallen away. And, and I just don't feel like God's in my life as much as He used to be. Well, today's your day to come back home to Jesus. You might even feel like the prodigal son who left his father and mother and, and, and went out and spent all of his inheritance and realized that, man, this life out here in the world is not what it's cut out to be and that I need to get back home. Maybe you're here today. You never prayed a simple prayer. Jesus, come into my heart. Take away my sin. Lord forbid that something bad happened to you today and you, you don't know if you're going to go to heaven or hell. Well, I don't want you to leave this service without the assurance that you know, without a shadow of a doubt, you're going to go to heaven and not hell. With everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed, and I want this to be very serious. Please, not a lot of moving around. This is, this is a, a very special time. If you're here today and you're like, yeah, I've fallen away from the Lord. I haven't been living for Him like I know I should. And I want to, I want to experience that, that fresh newness of, of, of life in Christ Jesus once again. I've lost my first love. I've lost my passion for Him. Maybe again, you've never prayed that simple prayer, Jesus, come into my heart. 
I want to give you that opportunity today to get right with Jesus. You know, the Bible says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. And by this simple action of just raising your hand right now, it's just a sign that you're saying, yeah, I'm, I'm doing business with Jesus today. I need to get right with him. If that's you, I want to give you that opportunity. Just raise your hand real high right now. Say, yeah, I need Jesus. Just across this place. Thank you. Thank you. Keep those hands raised up high. Thank you. Thank you for all those hands being raised. Hallelujah. Thank you. You said, today I'm going to get, keep your hand up, please. And, and today I'm going to get right with Jesus. Today's my day that, that I'm going to make a change for him. I want to also ask you to do something very bold. I want to pray with you, like I said. So if you raise your hand, just come on down. Meet me down front here. I know everybody might be looking, but it don't matter. This is between you and Jesus. So if you raise your hand, be bold. Be strong. Come on out here. Meet me right here. And come on down. Let's pray. I want to pray for you. Thank you, sir. Just stand right here. Come on down. Come on. Give them a hand. Come on, church. Getting right with Jesus today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Families getting saved and delivered today. Hallelujah. Come on, this is the day of salvation. Who else? Who else wants to receive Jesus today? Glory to God. Hallelujah. I want you to know today is the best day of your life. God knew this was going to happen. This is not surprising God today. God's like, wow, I can't wait to get them in church because I want to share my love with them. So I want you to know that everybody behind you has stood where you stood. There's nobody here judging you. Nobody here that's going to talk bad about you. We're all a part of the family. And we're excited to know what God's just about to do in your life. Hallelujah. So this is what I want you guys to do. I want you guys to put your hand on top of my hand so everybody just kind of circle up. Come on, circle up. Church, reach your hands out towards them today. And just repeat this after me. And church, you also. Heavenly Father. I stand before you today and I make a lot of mistakes and I need your help. Jesus, I recognize that you died on the cross and that you rose again on the third day and that you're alive. You took my sin at Calvary so I could live free from the power of sin. Today, I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Jesus, come into my heart and take away all my sin. I'm a new creation in Christ. The past is gone. Oh, the past is gone. A new life has begun. Empower me by the Holy Spirit to live for you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. And before you guys go and be seated. There's a gentleman right there. He's going to give you a card. If you would please fill that card out. And at the end of the service, just put it in the offering bucket or at the, the back, back there. We'll get in contact with you. It's a little box back over there. Okay? Come on, guys. Give them a hand. Hallelujah.